good to see you all this morning. <clears throat> it's been a busy several weeks. Had a good service Friday night and and Saturday up at uh, Piney Grove and their spring meeting. My mind, through the course of the song service, which was such a blessed service, has shifted direction somewhat. And I learned many, many years ago, in the early days of my ministry, when my mind began to change direction, I best follow it. So if you would open your Bibles with me to 2 Kings chapter 19. And I say that not to... Uh, for the only reason I mention that is because I, I need your prayers. I, I need your prayers. Every minister that rises needs your prayers. I'd like to speak to you this morning concerning a pattern of behavior when we receive bad news. What do you do when you get bad news? When you get bad news, and before your mind is settled with that, you get more bad news. Just one thing after the other happens. What do you do? How do you handle that? One of the ways that we show our faith is the manner in which we handle bad news. I'd like to talk to you about a king named Hezekiah and how he handled bad news. And he would receive bad news, news one after the other. So let's begin in chapter 19, 2 Kings chapter 19, verse number 1. And it came to pass when King Hezekiah heard it. He heard that the Assyrians were coming against him. And the Assyrians had conquered all the known world at that time. Nobody had been to, uh, able to stand against the Assyrian army. They were uh, so powerful that they had conquered every land, every city uh, that had come upon them, and they were able uh, to defeat all of their adversaries and take possession of all the lands that they had attacked. Now they had come to Judah, and they were threatening Judah and Jerusalem, and Hezekiah was the king of Judah. So try to position yourself in, uh, in, in, in Hezekiah's place. What would be your response? So many nations had just fallen to the Assyrians until they finally, they, when, when the Assyrian army arrived on their coast and at their cities, they simply gave up and turned their city over to them. So what would be your response when uh, such a, a bad thing was happening and a great army had approached you and, and all the other nations had simply fallen uh, to them? What would be your thought process? How would you handle that? When the news was so bad and you could not find any way to recover from it, you just did not know how you were going to get through this trouble. So Hezekiah, when he heard it, first thing he did, he, he rent his clothes. He just ripped his clothes. That was in anguish and in despair. They did such things as that when they didn't have an answer to the problem immediately. It was just so bad, it was so devastating, it was so heartbreaking, uh, so frightful that they just ripped their clothes. I don't know what to do, I don't know where to turn, I don't know how to handle this, I don't know how we're going to survive this. It came to pass that when Hezekiah heard the bad news, uh, that he rent his clothes and covered himself you know, with sackcloth. They did that as a show of humility. I have no place to turn, I am in such bad need, I am humbled, I don't have any worthiness to bring. Uh, so that anyone would uh, be of a mind to help me. I am in sackcloth. I am in misery. I am in despair. I am in great anguish. But that's not the end of the story. And went into the house of the Lord. The house of the Lord was the temple in that day. And so what he did, yes, he uh, recognized that he had no way, his army, his military, such as it was, had no way to defeat the Assyrian army. And they were threatening, and they were sending warnings to them uh, that you need to just go ahead and capitulate and turn your country over to us. 
Uh, because if you don't do that, we will destroy you. No other nation has been able to stand against us. All their gods failed them, and your God is going to fail you too. And so Hezekiah, he rent his clothes, he covered himself in sackcloth, and he, but he went into the house of the Lord. So that right there gives you the key. That's the key to the door of how to deal with great despair when you... Uh, when all you are you all you're receiving is bad news, one bad thing happening after the other. What do you do? The first thing you do is go to the house of the Lord. The answer to the problems that we're dealing with in our community is go to the house of the Lord. The answer to the problems we're dealing with nationally in our country is go to the house of the Lord. In our personal lives, there's troubles, there's anguish, there's trials. There's those things that just absolutely discourage us. If nothing else, a lot of us are getting old, and we're finding that parts of us are breaking and quitting, not functioning like they once did. And all those kind of things are happening. So what do you do? To do what we do is go to the house of the Lord. Our young folks are in despair. Our young folks are searching around trying to uh, figure out what is true and what's not true and where their comfort is and where their strength is. The answer is go to the house of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, which was over the household of Sheba, the scribe, and the elders of the priests, covered with cyclops. So he took some prominent men in his kingdom, and he said, told them, you put on sackcloth to show your despair in the, in the condition that we're in. And he sent them to Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amos. So he sent them to a preacher to a prophet, a man that they knew, they had confidence, uh, or was a man that was given to prayer, a man that communicated God's word to them. He says, you go to Isaiah. Now watch what he says. To them. And they said unto him, thus saith Hezekiah. This is Hezekiah's message to Isaiah. This day is a day of trouble. Now, that's easy to say, isn't it? And you can say that, and it just rolls off of your tongue until you are in trouble. You're in trouble, and the trouble is so bad that you don't have an answer for it. You sometimes think, well, this is the end of the road for me and my family, my community. We're just at the end of the road. We don't know what to do here. And so the first thing they said to Isaiah, we are in trouble. This is a day of trouble and of rebuke and blasphemy. This, this is a day when our enemies are saying bad things about us and about our God. This is a bad day. There's a lot of things being said in our country, bad things about our God. Denying him, denying his sovereignty, divine, uh, denying his authority over us and his power over us. He says, for the children are come to birth and there is no strength to bring forth. He says, it's as bad, it is just as bad as if a woman was about to give birth to a child and she did not have the strength to bring forth that child. She didn't have the strength to push and to do those things necessary to give birth to that child. That's what I, that's the way Hezekiah is describing their condition. We're in that kind of, we don't have the strength to get past this moment. Verse number four. He says, it may be the Lord thy God will hear all the words of Rabbishi, the, the man that has come, the, the general that's out there. It may be that God has already heard what he said. It could be that God has already heard uh, what the adversary has said against us. It could be that God already knows this. What do you think? You think the Lord knows the problem? He knows the trial? He says, whom the king of uh, Assyria is master. He says, he's the general that works for the king of Assyria, Sennacherib. He says, it may be that God has already heard what he said, and he knows the condition we're in. And so sometimes we wonder about that, do we not? 
uh, we wonder, Lord, do, do you really know? Our mind, natural mind, not our spiritual mind, but our natural mind says, Lord, do you know the trouble I'm having here? you know the trial that I'm in? you know what I'm dealing with, Lord? And oftentimes we come to that position where our natural mind asks that question, but our spiritual mind says, he already knows. He knows that I have confidence in him. He says, whom the king of Assyria, his master, has sent to reproach the living God. He says, the worst problem is not what he's doing and saying to us, but the worst problem is his blasphemy against God. He's denying the sovereignty of God. And so he already asked him, he said, well, who do you think you are trusting in this God, the God of Hezekiah? None of the other gods has been able to do anything about me, have been able to stop me and prevent me from conquering them. None of the other gods have been able uh, to stop me. Do you think that your God will be able to? So let me ask you this question this morning. Do you think that your God that you worship is able to solve whatever problem you have? Do you think he's able to take care of any enemies against him in this land? Do you suppose he's able to do that? He says, and will reproach the word, reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. He says, it may be that God has already heard it, and he's going to reprove it. He's going to do something about it. Do you have confidence this morning that your God can do something about it? Those words of our land and our community that reproach his name, the troubles that come up against you, do you suppose that God is able to do something about that? He says, wherefore, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that are left. He says, wherefore, he says, pray for us. There's a small group here that's faithful to you. He says, so lift up your prayer to us. And that is a, that is a very significant request. Pray for us. And that, that ought to be the mode that we're all in. Pray for us. We ought to pray for each other. Pray for our community as we have this morning. Two wonderful prayers have been offered. Pray for those that are sick, those who are in trouble. And as Brother Robert said, those that are here and those that are not here. We ought to pray for them. We ought to pray for the leaders of our country. We're commanded to pray for the leaders of our country. That God would give them wisdom to make good decisions that we might live in peace and worship in peace in this land. But you know there's a downside to that. Every time the children of Israel lived in a period of peace, what did they do? They forgot the God that had given the peace to them. And so after a while they would get down into the pits again and the Syrians would come. And where did they turn? Back to the Lord. But you know our God is faithful. He's a loving God. When we get down into that state, it's like your children. It's like our children. Today's Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, by the way. It's like our children. If your child misbehaves and gets into bad trouble, are you going to disown that child? Now, you might let them go a little while to experience the troubles that they've gotten themselves in to so they might learn not to do that again. But when that child begins to cry out to you, what are you going to do? You're going to come to that child's aid and deliver that child to the best of your ability. So he says to, has, uh, to Isaiah, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that are left. He said, now notice he emphasizes that there's a remnant left. He said, the whole, there, there's some out there that just don't care. Just turn it over to the Assyrians and everything will be fine. But this is God's land. This is a land that God has blessed, a people that God has blessed, a people that God has chosen to worship Him. There's a remnant left. And guess what? All through the ages, there's been a remnant of the whole that's left to worship Him. Then verse number 6, And Isaiah's answer was this, And Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall ye say to your master, that is to Hezekiah, he gives them an answer from the Lord. He says, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard, of which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. He says, Don't be afraid of that. Now, throughout the Bible, we, we're commanded to be not afraid. Don't be discouraged. Uh, just, just don't be afraid. And so, our natural mind says, Really? I hope the Lord's got this whole picture here. I hope the Lord knows how big this army is and how powerful. That's our natural mind. And he knows how small we are. Uh, you know, I, I just hope the Lord's got the whole picture here. That's what our natural mind says. But our spiritual mind says he can handle it. He can take care of it. So the, so the, our, our duty is to focus upon our spiritual thoughts above our natural thoughts. 
Because if it was dependent upon us and our natural ability, uh, Hezekiah would have been sunk, Judah would have been sunk, the whole nation of Israel, uh, Israel would have been sunk because they didn't have the ability to defend themselves, but God is not hindered and limited as we are. He says in verse number 7, Behold, this is God still speaking, Behold, I will send a blast upon him. I like that. A blast. Now what do you think of it when you hear blast? You know, I'm traveling through the mountains, the countries up there, when they'll be, they'll be blowing uh, through the mountains and, um, and building highways. They set, put dynamite in the sides of those mountains. They blow half the mountain away. You, just, you can see it at a distance. And when the blast goes off, half of that mountain, that mountain that looks so st- strong and sturdy, looks like it just couldn't, that, that nothing could move that mountain. But you, you listen and you hear the big boom, and then half of that mountain just falls off into the valley. That's God says, I'm like that. He says, that mountain, the Assyrian army that you think that's just so powerful that there's no nothing that can stop them. He says, I'm going to send a blast. And when God blasts, things happen, by the way. He says, behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor. You know, God is the, he's the best military tactician of all. One of the one of the, uh, the, the one of the very effective tactics used by the military is to um, provide bad information to the enemy, to make them think that you can do something you can't. You know that during World War II, we had, I believe, it was a whole division in Germany that really wasn't. They had big loudspeakers playing. And that, that sounded like tanks moving, like trucks moving, and men giving command, and they had radio signals, uh, signaling different units that didn't even exist. And the units were talking about all it was was some little army soldier over here talking to another one over there, and the Germans were hearing that, and they thought they were up against a huge army, so the Germans focused uh, their attention in a place where there wasn't really anybody while we were doing our job somewhere else. And so... Th- God, man didn't come up with that. God did. So he, he, he gave him a rumor. He said, he shall hear a rumor and shall return to his own land. He says, he's going to hear a rumor uh, that God is going to send to them. And they're going to hear that rumor. And they're going to get so discouraged that they're going to return to their homeland. And I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Now that's the macro. That, that king is going to fall by sword in his own land. And so... Then when they hear that, you know, if you were Hezekiah and that message came back to you, would you have a sense of peace? Everything's going to be fine? Well, it, it, and he did. I'm sure he did. So, verse number 8, so uh, Rabshakeh returned and, and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna, uh, for he heard that it was departed from Lachish, and when he heard say that the king of Ethiopia, behold, he has come to fight against thee. Remember, God said he's going to hear a rumor. So he hear, heard this rumor. He sends messengers again to Hezekiah. So when he heard that the Egyptian army was coming to fight against him, that got his attention. I mean, he got ever serious because the Egyptian army was a mighty army. So when he heard that, he sent a message to Hezekiah. Now, this message is going to be... Now, he's not telling Hezekiah this, but he says, I better get Hezekiah to give in right now. Hurry before this Egyptian army gets there. Because once the Egyptian army gets here, the whole picture is going to say, God sent him a rumor. Now, watch this. Thus shall ye speak to Hezekiah. So he sent a message to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Let not thy God in whom thy trust deceive thee. <laughs> Don't let God uh, tell you that he's going to save you from me. Uh, God, uh, your God's going to deceive you. He's going to tell you that he can defeat you. And he said, but don't let him deceive you. And so that is a, that's still a tactic of the devil. Uh, just don't let God think that he can handle this problem. Uh, if you take up your cross and follow him, that means you're going to have trouble. But cross represents trouble. If you take up your cross and follow Jesus Christ, it comes with trouble. You need to expect troubles. And so the adversary would say, just don't let... Just don't let God deceive you in telling you that he can handle your trouble. But we know better, don't we? Now watch Hezekiah. He says, saying, Let not thy God, in whom thou trustest, uh, deceive thee, saying, Jerusalem shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Don't let God tell you that the Assyrians are not going to take you. 
Now, because, you know, we're more, more powerful, we've conquered all these lands, we've conquered all these cities, so just don't let them, uh, let God tell you that he can handle a job because we can defeat you. And so our natural mind tells us that. Uh, that uh, the problems are just so great, there's not much chance of overcoming it. The trials are so great. The obstacles are so large. It's just, there's, I just don't see any way that I can overcome this trouble. You ever, you ever have that? You ever go through that thought process? I just don't see any way that all these problems can get solved. Let me give you an illustration. This morning, we stopped by the grocery store to pick up some things for lunch. As we were coming out, I came by the street there where Sister Beverly and Sister Ashley live. And I had a bad flashback. Right after the hurricane, I was trying to get to every one of you to make sure that you were still alive. I, could, I, I didn't know. I had no idea where you, got, you all were alive or not. I had no communication, so I didn't know. And I went down one road. I started to turn down one road, and and it was blocked, trees just, just crisscrossed across the road, and houses smashed all around. Went to another road, and it was the same way. Went to the another. And so my mind began to tell me, they're not all right. There's something bad wrong with me. My heart was just a pounding in me. And by the way, on the way over there, I looked down to, toward the Howell's house, and all I could see was mayhem and destruction. And my mind began to tell me, they're not all right. I, it just, I just don't see how they could have survived this. And then when a guy finally found a way into the spa and he found out and, uh, that, well, they were all, they, they were, nobody was hurt. The house was ruined, but nobody was hurt. Got to find out about the house. Their house was ruined, but nobody was hurt. But my natural mind was telling me there's no way that anybody could survive this. And I knew that I'd lost the whole church family. I just, I knew uh, in my natural mind, I knew that it was that bad. But my heart was telling me that God is able to handle that. And so this is the kind of thought process that Hezekiah was going through. He says, don't let your God tell you uh, that you're going to make it through this. Saying, Jerusalem shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, thou hast heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the land. He says, you've heard that everywhere we went, we conquered those cities and those nations. Nobody has been able to stand against us. By destroying them utterly, and shalt thou be delivered? What a question. Do you think that you were going to be unique from all of the cities and nations we've taken and destroyed? Do you think that you're any better off than they? Do you think that they're stronger than they? So that's a good question. Do you, do you think that you're going to be delivered? So do you think that? Let me ask you a question this morning. Whatever your troubles are, whatever you're dealing with, do you think this morning that God can deliver you? Now watch this. He says, have the gods of the nations delivered them which uh, my fathers have destroyed? He says, uh, could any of the other gods of the other nations save them? So what's the, your answer to that? No, because there are no gods at all. There's only one God. But our God... He's almighty. He's on his throne. He has power and he knows you and he loves you. He loves you so much that he sent his only begotten and beloved son in this world to die for you. What a great love that is, Ephesians 2 and 4. It's a great love for which he has loved you. Do you suppose for a moment that he's going to forsake you in your hour of trial? And he goes through and lists them all out. And then comes verse number 13. He says, where's the king of Hamath? And the king of Arpad, and the king of the city of Sephirah, them, and Hena, and Iva. Where are all those kings? What happened to them? So he goes, uh, the devil knows how to discourage. He'll start firing information at you. This trouble, that trouble. Nobody survived against me. And he will discourage. The devil's best tool is discouragement. And believe you me, he uses it very effectively. Well, what does Hezekiah do? Verse number 14. And Hezekiah received the letter of, uh, of the hand of the messengers. This is the last, uh, a letter that the king, the, uh, the general that served his, uh, Sennacherib, sent to Hezekiah. And he read it. And Hezekiah went into the house of the Lord. I want you to notice what he did with it. I remember before when he got the bad news, he went to the house of the Lord. Now he receives this letter. What does he do with the letter? 
He takes the letter to the house of the Lord. That is, he's going to lay it before the Lord and spread it before the Lord. What's the Lord going to do? Can the Lord read? Yes, he can. He can read. Could he read Hebrew? Could he read Greek? Could he read Latin? Can he read German? Can he read uh, Chinese? Can he read American English? Can he? He can. He laid the letter before the Lord. He spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed. The next thing he did, now, now the picture behind this is that he brought it to the Lord. Our first step ought to be to bring our troubles to the Lord. Bring it to the Lord. And then Hezekiah prayed before the Lord. And this is what he said in his prayer. He says, O Lord God of Israel. O Lord. That word Lord there comes from the word that is some other places which are uh, trans, uh, translated as uh, Jehovah. Usually the, the only, the true, and the living, self-existing God. So when we bowed in prayer this morning, we were praying to the God that there is none other like. We prayed to the God whose power is derived from himself and not another. We prayed to the God that has always been, is, and will always be. We prayed to the God that has chosen his people before the foundation of the world and sent his very own son to die for those people. Is that a great love? Is that a wonderful love? And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, uh, which dwelleth between the cherubims. The cherubims were over the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place. And once a year, once a year, the high priest would go in to that most holy place and God would uh, present himself to the high priest between the cherubims over the mercy seat, uh, which is uh, with the Ark of the Covenant. And the point of that is God met them there and he heard the prayers and the petitions and received the sacrifices for Israel. Now, in Hebrews 4 and 16, the picture has changed. Because of what Jesus Christ has done for you, you can therefore now, yourself, come boldly unto the throne of grace. That is the throne, uh, uh, as the allegory goes, between the cherubims where God will meet you there and there's where you obtain mercy and find grace to what? To help in time of need. He said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwelleth between the cherubims, thou art the God. You're not a God, you're the God. We don't worship a God this morning, we worship the God, the God of all man-made gods. Even thou alone. We don't worship any other but you. Now, that's important uh, because your God is a jealous God. Uh, we're to worship only the God, and we worship the God in the manner that he has prescribed and not in the manner that our natural mind might like or what anybody or a group uh, uh, might come together and decide this is the best way to worship God. But God has told us how to worship him, and where do we find it? In the word of God. Even thou alone, all the kingdoms of the earth, uh, of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. He says, you made it all. You made the earth. You give, you've given authority and power to the kings. You can give it, and you can take it away. That's the confidence we have in the Lord our God. Now he says, Lord, here's his petition. Lord, bow down thine ear and hear. Now, God is omniscient. He's everywhere simultaneously. So did you suppose that he literally heard Hezekiah's prayer? Yeah. Do you suppose that he knew what uh, Hezekiah was going to ask him before he got there? Yes. But what Hezekiah said, Lord, I need the assurance in my soul that you're hearing me. I need to feel that you're hearing me and that you're going to help me. I need to have that confidence in my heart. You know why I needed that? Because every one of us have a human nature, do we not? Anybody here not have a human nature? If you don't have a human nature, then we need to have your funeral today. Okay? But you have a human nature and you have doubts associated with that human nature. But there's a spiritual part of us that says, well, my God is hearing me. He knows the trouble that I'm having. He knows the trials that I'm facing. So, Lord, bow down thy ear and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes and see. 
Now, don't you know that Hezekiah knew that God was looking on that scene and knew what was going on there? But Lord, I need to know in my heart and mind that you're seeing this trouble. I want you to hear what I'm saying. I want you to see this trouble. And the message was, I want you to let me know that you're hearing and that you're seeing. Open, Lord, thine eyes and see and hear the words of Sennacherib, uh, which had uh, sent him to reproach the living God. Not just to reproach Israel or Jerusalem or Judah, but here he's reproaching the living God because this is God's people at that time. He chose them out of all peoples to serve him, and he's reproaching them. And by the way, he's reproached God, saying, Do you think that your God can deliver you? Let me ask you a, 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 a peripheral question here. Do you think that God can deliver you from the troubles you're having? Okay. Do you think that your God can deliver you from the sin that you're in in this life? Yes, He can. Has He done that? Our faith tells us that by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, but by one man came life. Who's that man? Jesus Christ. Now, verse number 17. He says, of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations in their land. He says, it's true. Everything he said in this letter about their accomplishments are true. We have a mighty foe. We have a mighty enemy that is able to destroy all, our, all, of, our, all of the other countries. But now they've come to us. But what's the difference? The difference is our God is the God. He's the Lord God Almighty. And when and he says, and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods. Hezekiah was smart enough to know that their gods were no gods. But our God is the God, but the work of men's hands, wood and stones, right? the idols, the things they carry around, the things they pray through. He says, all of that is nothing. But we worship the God. Therefore, they have destroyed. That's, that's how they can destroy them, because they were no gods at all. Verse number 19. Now, therefore, O Lord, our God. He goes back. He's back in a position. He's now, therefore, Lord. Now, knowing that they were no gods at all. Now, therefore, Lord, we know that you are. Right. Therefore, Lord, we know that you are the God. I beseech thee. That word beseech has a powerful meaning behind it. That means I'm begging you, Lord. I'm reaching out to you. I'm looking to you as a child that looks to his parents for protection, for instruction, for love, and for God's. I beseech thee, save thou us out of his hand. Now, notice he didn't say in this case, I want you to, Lord, uh, I want you to make me a mighty soldier so I can go save ourselves. He said, Lord, save us. Do something, Lord. We're just so frail. You know, we're like that woman that's trying to give birth and her body is so weak that she cannot give birth to that child. That's the way we are. So, Lord, we need you to save us. We're at our ropes end. We don't know where to turn. We can't help ourselves. And obviously nobody else is going to help us. So, Lord, we're depending on you to save us. That all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God if even thou only. He says, not just to be, uh, not to, just to deliver us, but that the whole world would know that the God that we worship is the God. That ought to be our prayer. Lord, we want everybody to know that you are the God. Even though they don't love you, don't want you, they need to know that you are the God. That's what we want the whole world to know, that the God that we worship is the God. He's almighty and all the other gods are zero. Then, verse number 20, Isaiah the son of Amos sent to Hezekiah. Notice now, this is an unusual event. He didn't bring that letter to, uh, to Isaiah. He took the letter into the temple, presented to the Lord and prayed. But then Isaiah, who didn't get the letter, he didn't hear the prayer, he still gets an answer from God. Watch that. You know, that's amazing how God works, isn't it? God just knows everything. He knows exactly what he's going to do and how he's going to do it. Then Isaiah, then Isaiah, the son of Amos, said to Hezekiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, that which thou hast prayed to me against the Necrob, king of Assyria, I have heard. Now, what a blessed thought to know that God has heard you when you pray. Have you ever been down on your knees 
and and you begin to pray, and then all of a sudden you get this warm, comforting feeling that God has heard me. And when you get that feeling, you know then it's going to be all right. You may not know how, but you know that it's going to be just fine. This is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning him. He says, the virgin daughter of Zion hath despised thee. He says, you know this little woman over here uh, that um, is so weak that she can't even give birth to her child. She's talking about Judah and Jerusalem. You know, she's so frail that you, she can't bring forth this child. That's the way she looks anyway. You just don't think that she can do it. He says, the virgin daughter of Zion hath despised thee. That means, I mean, she's going to get the victory today and you're going to lose. That's what that means. I'm going to give her the victory and you are going to lose. And laugh thee to scorn. You mighty army that's conquered the whole world and you think that you're going to take her. She's going to laugh at you and you're going to go away in fear and in total uh, destruction. He says, the daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head at thee. That means you pitiful excuse of a human being. There's just not much to you at all. You are, all you were is a bunch, of, a bunch of hot air. There's nothing to you. You're going to lose this battle and you're going to go home in shame. You know, that's, that's the way God talks. <laughs> You know, can you imagine Hezekiah standing up on the wall and saying that before the Lord gave him the message? No, because he had already ripped his clothes, and I mean, he was in despair. But God said a message, sent a message to the Assyrian army, you're going to lose today. I mean, you, your end has come. He says, whom thou hast reproached and blasphemed, and uh, uh, against whom thou hast exalted thy voice and lifted up thine eyes on high. That means you, you looked arrogant and condescending to these this little remnant, even against the Holy One of Israel. You've even lifted up your eyes in arrogance against God. That was his big mistake right there. And he says, I am stronger and more powerful than your God. God was patient. He's long-suffering. He will take a lot. But there comes a point when God says, that's enough. I've had all I'm going to take out of you. And when God moves, uh, dreadful things happen. Watch this. He says, By thy messengers uh, thou hast reproached the Lord, and hast said, With the multitude of, thy, of my church, I am come uh, t uh, up to the heights of the mountains, to, uh, to the sides of Lebanon, and will cut down the tall cedars, and the choice fir trees, and I will enter into the lodgings of his borders, and into the forest of Carmel. He says, I'm going to come in, I'm going to strip the land. I'm, of all of your, your timbers, I'm going to go into the houses, I'm going to take everything out of the houses, I'm going to strip your land of everything that you have. I'm going to take it all. That's what the Assyrians said. I dig down and drunk uh, strange uh, waters, and the soles of my feet I've dried up all the, uh, the rivers uh, of besieged cities. And then it says, Hast thou not heard? This is the message, Hast thou not heard? Long ago, how I have done it? God says, I, I, I've been around for a long time. I've been around longer than you Assyrians have. I've been around a long time. And of anxious time, I have formed it. All this stuff you say, say that you have conquered, God says, I made it. <laughs> you know, that's God speaking. He says, you, you think you took it and you want it? Well, I made it. It belongs to me. Now have I brought it to pass that thou shouldest be lay, uh, uh, should be to lay waste fenced uh, cities and ruinous heaps. Therefore, their inhabitants were of small power. He says, those folks you think you've conquered, there wasn't much to them anyway. But now you come up against God. You're against God. And you're against my, my daughter. You think that she's so frail that she can't even bring forth a child. She can't defend herself against you. But you've come up against her God. Therefore, their inhabitants were of small power. They were dismayed and con confounded. They were as the grass of the field and the, the green herb and all those kind of things. They just, they just don't survive well. Verse number 27, but I know thy abode. Now, this is God speaking. God says, I know where you live. I know where you live. Yeah. You know, and I was watching an old movie one time. It's about the gangsters and... And one gangster said to one of the law enforcement officers, says, we know where your house is. Well, the, gang, uh, the law enforcement officer, he rushed home and got his family out of town because he knew what that meant. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure that the Assyrian generals knew what that meant too. God says, I know where your house is. I know, I know, I know how to take care of you, but I, I know uh, thy abode and, and thy coming out and, and thy coming in. 
And thy right he said, I know when you come out of your house and when you go in. You know, nowadays we got satellite systems. And we can look down on our enemy and we can see everywhere they go. We can see when they come. As a matter of, matter of fact, according to the movies, let me put it this way, according to the movies, from the satellite they could even see inside the house. How about that? So this is not a new concept. God says, I can look down and I know when you come out of your house and I know when you go in your house. That's amazing, isn't it? That's quite a God we've got. He says, because thy rage against me and thy tumult is come up into mine ears. God says, I've heard all about uh, all the trouble that you've caused in the world. Therefore, I will put my hook in thy nose. That means you're going to serve me. I'm going to put my hook in, my, in your nose. I'm going to lead you around, and you're going to follow me, and you're going to do what I tell you to do. You think you own the world, but you're going to be submissive to me. You know, God can talk that way, can't he? Now, he's the God. He owns it all. He says, and my bridle in thy lips. You know what a bridle does? You know, in today's world, folks just don't have a clue anymore about these kind of things. But, but a, a bridle is what they put on a horse or other animals. And when the rider would uh, pull the, uh, the, the reins in one direction or the other, the animal would respond to it. Because they used to have a bar between there that would actually twist and pinch the lip. If they didn't, if they didn't know why they were talking, it would pinch the lip. And so God said, I'm going to pinch your lips until you obey me. I'm going to, I know how to get close to you. I know how to make you submissive to me. And I will turn thee back by the way which thou, thou camest. He said, I'm just going to turn you around and I'm going to send you home. And you're going to go home in shame. And this shall be a sign unto thee. Listen to this now. Now, now we're talking about Hezekiah's trouble and his enemy. But don't forget we have troubles too. And the same God that took care of Hezekiah's trouble is the same God that reigns today. He's the same God that's solving our troubles too. He says, and this shall be a sign unto thee. Ye shall eat, now this is uh, uh, to Judah, this is a message to Judah. He says, and ye shall eat this uh, year such things as, as grow of themselves. He's telling Hezekiah, he said, you've been through a lot. So this year, you just go out in the crop out into the fields, you know, from the seed that's fallen last year, there's going to be fields grow up, and you're going to eat that this year. You're not even going to have to plant. You're not even going to have to till your fields. You just go out there and gather what just grows up of itself, and you just eat it. I like to do that. When I was a kid, I liked to do that. I went out and, and I ran the rattlesnakes off, and I ate blackberries. I, I, I went to, I mean, there's old bullets, grapevines out there, persimmon trees. I, I just loved it. There, there was old crab apple trees out there. I, 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 mom, uh, mom always wondered why I wasn't that hungry when I got home, but I fed in the woods out there. And so God is telling Hezekiah, he says, this year, all you, you just go out there and pick it and eat it. And in the second year, that which springeth of the same, he says, the next year, you just eat of the fields. There. There's going to be plenty out there then. You don't even have to plant. And in the third year, where well, you're going to sow then and reap and plant vineyards and eat the fruits thereof. He says, for the first two years after, after the Syrians are gone, they've stripped your land. But after the, uh, for the first two years, I'm just going to feed you right off the land. Well, then the third year, you're going to get to plant the crops and you're going to feed yourself. Verse number 30. And the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall yet again. Watch this now. Now, he takes... He takes this scene and he transports it to the New Testament. Okay? God can do that. Can he do that? He has the authority to do that. He, he can just say, okay, now I taught you this lesson. And so, I'm going to take you now. God has said, I'm going to take you to the New Testament and tell you what I'm going to do over there. Now watch this. He says, in the remnant that has escaped to the house of Judah. By the way, do you know that that happened? Well, when the persecution came upon the church in the New Testament period, that God permitted the church to escape Jerusalem, Judah, uh, and when the persecution became great, that's, the, that's how the church at Antioch got started. They fled as far as Antioch. They uh, distributed all over the world, uh, and they set up churches, they preached, and they formed communities, and God blessed them mightily. Watch this. And the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall yet again take root downward uh, and bear root where? Upward. He says, yep. Yeah. 
You can go through some bad times, but God still has a remnant, and He's going to bless that remnant, and He's going to prosper that remnant. So now we look at ourselves, and we say, okay, now, now it's so bad now, we, 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 we've lost folks, the folks have moved away, and we're in despair, our houses are, are in ruin, and this has happened, our schools are in ruin, all these bad things have happened, I just don't see much better at all. But remember what Hezekiah did. The first thing he did is went to the house of the Lord and took the problem to the Lord. That's the answer today. Is take it to the Lord. Take the problem and just lay it before him. Say, Lord, you see the condition we're in. We need your deliverance, Lord. We need your help. We need your strength. We need your comfort. We don't need you just to, just to, just to make us able. The problem is so big we can't solve it. But Father, you've never, you have never had a problem you couldn't solve. There's never been an adversary so powerful that you couldn't defeat him. Sometimes we wonder. I've, I've, had, I've been talking to people. I said, well, I think our country is about done. It, it's about over. It's, it's gotten so bad, so much ungodliness and wickedness that I just, I think it's, I've had a number of people just tell me in great despair, I just don't think we can, we, we, can, we can have a better day. You know, I'm just not buying that. I'm just not going to have it. Because the God that we worship this morning is the same God that's delivered his church and people for 2,000 years. Amen. That same God reigns today. And by the way, our hurricane is not the first one either. Our church has survived um, storms, tornadoes, it has, uh, and, um, and earthquakes. When you read the history of our people and how they were pushed around the world, up out of Asia, uh, uh, Asia Minor into Southern Europe, they moved ahead of persecution, but God blessed them at every stop. I think it was around 1,500, 1,400, something around there. Our uh, ancestors, the Waldenses, it's reported that there were so many of them in Europe that a man could leave Holland and travel down to Italy, walking, and every night stay in the home of a Walden Sea brother. How about that? God can do that, can't he? He can lift up, he can comfort, he can strengthen, he can help. Hezekiah's message to us, by the grace of God, is you cannot face an enemy bigger than God. You don't have a trouble that's greater than God. Our duty is to do just exactly what Hezekiah... Oh, by the way, that wasn't the end of the bad news for Hezekiah. Because it, right after this, if you read on the next chapter, he received word, you need to get your house in order, you're about to die. You're, you're going to die. Hezekiah, wasn't, in his mind, he wasn't ready to die. So he prayed, and God heard his prayer. And God added, what was it, 15 years to his life? There's one trouble after another. But where did he turn? Always he turned to God. Let that be our first step in time of trouble, to turn to the Lord our God. May God bless you, my friend.